Good morning, friends. This is Tony from Historic American Homes. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, and we're going to do a little more work on our chateau. So we've got the floor plans all pretty much worked out. And what I wanted to talk about in this video was a kind of overview of a couple of points regarding lighting and electrical plans. I'm not going to go into too much depth on any of these points. The idea is more just to give you a overview of things to consider, uh, be aware of when you're working out your ideas for your electrical and lighting needs. I'll touch on a few small building code points and then we will look at how we can actually show our intentions in our working drawings through using SketchUp's companion program called Layout. So here's our beautiful chateau. Sun's shining and we're getting ready to go inside. I'm going to put this beautiful picture aside and we're going to look at a few more technical things. This is the ground floor floor plan. I touched on that in the previous video or the one before last on how to set up the file to create your floor plan in layout. And let me bring up my notes here. I'm going to start with a few little bits from the building code that we need to keep in mind as we're working on our ideas. So I will bring up the building code. This is the IRC 2018, which is the International Residential Code for 2018. It gets updated three, every three years. So they're working on an update right now, which will be published very shortly. Eventually, your local jurisdiction may adopt the 2021 but there tends to be a lag. In fact, there are many jurisdictions that haven't even adopted the 2018 yet and are still on the 2015. In the end, all these code issues are defined by your jurisdiction. So you always need to check with your local building department. But until you've done that, the base code, the International Residential Code is a good, as good a place as any to work from. So regarding plugs, receptacle outlets, couple of points, I'll, be, I'll just go through them quickly. Basically, it says that you need to have plugs every 12 feet. That's what it comes down to. If you look at this picture here, it says you have to be no more than six feet from a plug. So that adds up six feet in each direction gives you 12 feet. If you have a very short piece of wall, something under two feet in width that's interrupted on both sides. For example, you might have a small section of wall between the door to a bedroom and the closet right next to it. it might be just six or eight inches. You don't need a plug in that piece of wall. But if it's anything two feet or wider, you need to count it towards the six feet. So you wrap around the corners when you do your six feet. So my general rule of thumb is at least every 12 feet, put a plug and then put one at least one in every wall. So a small bedroom will typically have three walls with a plug in each wall, and the fourth wall will be mostly taken up by a closet and door. So you'd have at least three plugs in that wall if it's a small bedroom. If it's a medium-sized bedroom, you can expect more. And for a large bedroom, you should really place them where you think they're most needed based on what furniture arrangements you expect to see keeping in mind a 12 foot maximum distance. When you talk about kitchens, there's a different set of rules and it basically, basically it comes down to four feet between plugs in simple terms. There's a whole bunch of different conditions that pop up with kitchens. So there are a variety of exceptions, but for, so for example, you don't count the space behind the stove Here's the stove. You don't count the space behind the stove. You don't count the space behind the sink. But any, any piece of countertop that is 12 inches or more wide, that includes 12, needs to have a plug. And, then though, and if you have a long stretch of counter, you can't go for more than four feet without a plug. If the space behind your sink, that's what this diagram shows, is deeper than 12 inches, is 12 inches and, or deeper, then again, it counts and you have to consider it when placing your plugs. If it's a corner, you don't have to count it. So those are some basic rules you're gonna to need to keep in mind regarding building code. Now, I think that's really all we need to do as far as code issues. 
So we're going to go to our floor plan and I'm going to show you, uh, let me pull up my notes. 12 inches apart max practicality. Okay, we'll move on to the actual design ideas here. My basic philosophy when it comes to electrical layouts and lighting, more so this with lighting, is practicality rules. I think it's not necessary to overdo it. You don't need to turn your house into a movie theater. On the other hand, if you have a, a room dedicated to media and you want to create your own little home theater, then by all means in that room, you know, go over the top and use colored lights and disco balls and all the rest. But really, too often I have found that if people end up going to a lighting store and hooking up with a lighting designer whose real purpose is to try to sell you as much stuff as possible, you're going to end up paying for a lot of things you don't need. <clears throat> they might be appealing, but that you'll find you just end up not using. And you've shelled out a lot of money for a bunch of stuff that never gets used. Better to plan how that money is spent and put it where you can really benefit from it and enjoy it. So practicality rules. Common sense is important when planning your layout. There are, again, some you know, basic requirements. If you apply common sense and think about your everyday living patterns, you will make a good electrical plan. Let's take a look here. Our chateau is essentially formal and elegant. I think those two words summarize the character of the building and consequently the character that would be appropriate for its lighting. As we ap approach the entry from the outside and coming up to the front door, code requires that every door to the outside has a light. So I've placed lights on either side of the front door and they're operated from a switch just inside the front door. There's a similar arrangement at the back door and at all the other doors that lead to the outside. I have in mind a fixture. I will bring that picture up. I have a mind fixture like this for either side of the front door. It's got a basically classical kind of line. The This curl of ironwork here, it makes, I think, a good complement to the balcony. So this is going to be a type of fixture I'm going to apply. And I'm actually going to put that in the SketchUp model just so that it can be there for the renderings. I will be making a small uh, live modeling session video of making that lamp probably not narrated. So when that comes out, I'll let you know. Lowe's.com is a great website for lighting, at least for getting ideas to find out what sorts of things are readily available. No need to go with something exotic and hard to find when there are so many choices at a place like Lowe's. Lamps Plus is another great source. If you're looking for ideas, browse their websites. So something like that on either side of the front door with a switch just inside the door to operate it. Next to that switch, there will be a second switch, which will operate two suspended fixtures in the hallway. And at the back door, a second switch for that same line. If you see the switch, it has a three. That indicates a three-way switch, which means that there are two switches operating that, that same line. Now, these are going to be, we have 10-foot ceilings in these main spaces. So we have a little bit of space there. We can play with having a nice suspended fixture. So I have placed two fixtures, equal distances from the front and back doors so that they're symmetrical. And I chose that distance by setting the front fixture on the axis of the openings that go from the dining room and the living room to the entry. So when you're standing in the middle of the entry with the dining room and the living room to either side, there's a fixture over your head. I've aligned that fixture with the fixture in the dining room on the right and with the living room on the left. I've then placed in the living room a second suspended fixture, same distance from the back wall as it is from the front wall. I've also centered these two fixtures on the wall between these two windows on each side of the room. So they bring light down towards the middle of the room and align with these walls. <clears throat> now I'm going to turn the furniture layer on here because it's good to consider the furniture when you're planning your lighting. You know, when I make the SketchUp models, I always include furniture as I'm building the design in SketchUp because I know that's a way to, it's a way to guarantee that 
I'm considering things like circulation and appropriate amount of space. However, you don't normally show furniture on construction drawings. So I had it turned off when we were looking at this a moment ago, and I will turn it off again. The furniture layer will be turned off when I'm done here. But like I said, it's great for considering it when you're working on lighting. So we have these two suspended, they will be some kind of small chandeliers, two suspended lights. They have a switch at each entrance to the room. So again, a three-way switch. When you come in off the entry, the switch is just to the left. And when you come in from the other side of the room, the switch is just to the right. Now I have a second group of lights that go around the perimeter of the room. And these are recessed lights. Um, recessed lights are, they have their uses and they're, they're quite practical, but they get misused a lot as well. So I'm gonna talk about how I use them here and what to be careful with when you're using recessed lights. For a start, I haven't flooded the room with lights. This is a living room. It's not a surgery in a hospital. You don't need to be able to do you know, high intensity work in this kind of a space. You need to be able to relax. So I have not flooded this room with light and I think that's a mistake that's all too often done. In fact, let me show you a photograph here. This is what not to do. A grid of recessed can lights. You've got two terrible things going on here. One is incredible glare because you've got this dark ceiling, completely inadequately lit. It's daytime outside and this room is dark and this ceiling is dark. So a complete failure of using of designing using natural light. And then you've got this terrible contrast between the can lights and the ceiling. You've also got this grid of lights, which is intended to try to light the entire space to the same level from the ceiling. That's not how light works. The number one principle to understand when you're doing lighting design is that lights don't light a space. Lit surfaces light a space. The light has to fall on surfaces for the room to be lit. So the focus should be on what surfaces are you lighting? Basically, all these lights in the middle of the room here are not lighting anything. They're just creating glare spots. The lights around the perimeter are trying desperately to light these walls, but with the dark paint on them, that wall is absorbing all the lights. So again, you end up with this intense glare between the window and the wall between the light fixture and the wall. Now, you may have noticed the URL on this image here, Laurel Byrne Interiors. I'm not really familiar with her work, but I do wanna say that she posted this image as an example of what's wrong. So this is not a reflection on any part of her work. So I'm sure she's a fine designer and she's using this as I am as an example of what not to do. So, Okay, what not to do? That's one terrible use of can lights. Now I'm going to mention another thing or two about can lights. Let's see if I... This is Philips, and Philips has tremendous number, a variety of nice light fixture designs. This one I picked because I wanted to show you it has these ridges inside the can. These ridges are a very clever way they have, a very good idea, to reduce the contrast between the light bulb itself and the surrounding surface. So again, you don't have as much glare because the contrast is great. There's a gradient between the bulb and the surface around it. So when you're picking a recessed can light, especially if it's an LED type light, um, there's a real risk of glare and good fixtures can be designed to reduce that. This is an example of one. They have another that's very interesting where the bulb has a cover that is kind of frosted so you don't get the high pinpoint pricks of the leds and then the surface inside is matte so you're not getting a lot of re highly specular re reflections it's also recessed quite deeply so that you're less likely to actually see the face of the bulb when you're in the room so these are things to to consider when you're looking at recessed downlights, they def it's definitely worth paying a little extra for a better quality, well-designed light. 
Philips does make some lights that I'm not too keen on. They do some where the interior is polished metal, and that causes a lot of glare, high, high specularity. There's like a mirror, mirrored surfaces. They, they accentuate the contrast. So that's something to watch out for as well. All right, that's a, all I have to say about glare. So I've placed four of these recessed down lights towards the perimeter of the room to light the corners, which could potentially be a little darker. I've placed a light about three feet out from the fireplace, and it is indicated with this triangular shape. I'll zoom in here. This, that it's a spotlight to light the wall above the fireplace, where I'm figuring that there may be a piece of artwork, a painting, or some such thing on display. I've created a similar one on the right side of the room where we have this alcove, this niche, which I'm figuring will be something like a bookcase or a place to place an antique or a painting on the wall. So I have another one of those spots in that position. The lighting for the living room gives you four choices, basically no light. And if you're relying on natural daylight during the daytime, that's preferred. So that's choice number one. The second choice is you can flip the switch for the two chandeliers. They will nicely light the ceiling so you don't have a dark ceiling. Third choice is to do the perimeter lights. And then the fourth choice is to do both the chandeliers and the perimeter lights. So you've got four options there. And if you add dimmers to both of those lines, you've got even more options as far as how to light the space. Now that's really as complicated as lighting pretty much ever needs to get in any room except a kitchen. If you've got something set up like that, you've got lots of choices and you can create lots of nice moods. And it's quite simple to wire and, rel and comparatively inexpensive. There's one option that I'm considering that I have not implemented in this room and that is cove lighting. I'm going to come back to the living room when I've done more on the interior design of it and see if I want to use a cove. And if I do decide to use a cove, I may incorporate, incorporate a cove light as well. This little photo here shows a cornice that's been set down from the ceiling a few inches with a cove light uh, applied to it. This is not exactly how I would do it for this particular house, but it may be that I'll do something similar to, to this in the final design. A quick look at the dining room. We've got a dining table. It's not a big dining room. I've got a table seating eight here and there's basically not much room left in the space, but it's comfortable enough for formal dining. Most of the family dining is going to happen in the family room. I'm figuring that these two walls, the wall on the right and the wall at the top, will be places for artwork. So I have provided again these two spots, one facing each of those two walls. They will be on one switch. And then centered and over the dining table, I've placed one pendant light, one chandelier. So we again have our numerous options of combining these various lights on two separate switches. But given the small size of the room, really there's no need for more light than that. Now we will have two built-in china cabinets on the left wall. And I may decide to incorporate uh, a light into those. There's an interesting option that becomes available at that point, which is that you can get switches that are installed as a part of the door frame. So when you open the door, the light goes on. That's an interesting option. That's great for closets. Now I'm thinking that may not be the right approach for a china cabinet because you might just want to have the light on as part of the display. So if I do put lights in the china cabinets, I will probably put them on the same switch as the artwork lights. Now let's go over to the master bedroom. That's a good example of, uh, that's a good room for studying a little more about the lighting. We've got coming in the door of the master bedroom. I've got a switch to the left of the door and it's a three-way switch and it lights two uh, recessed can lights that are going to be lighting the area around this section of wall, which is where a dresser would go. Also, if, if the people using this room like to have a television, in their bedroom, that would be a likely spot for it. So I've provided a plug there for that purpose. 
The other switch for this three-way line is alongside one side of the bed. So if the light's left on, you don't have to get out of bed in order to turn it off. Now, bedrooms nowadays are too often, in my opinion, too often overlit. So that's really it for the lighting in this room. I have the sitting nook, this octagonal sitting nook, and I've provided a pendant fixture in the sitting nook which will provide a nice little focus of light where the sitting happens. Now that's really it for the bedroom lighting. The idea is that a bedside table on either side of the bed will have a table lamp on each side. So if you're in bed reading, you've got your table lamp, which would be much more practical. You're not lying in bed, reading a book and looking straight up at the ceiling with a can light directly over you, shining straight into your face and causing glare. I would not put recessed can lights over a bed. Bad idea. Much better to have a simple little table lamp and a plug close by for it. That's as much lighting as, in my opinion, a bedroom not only needs, but that, that, I mean, it's better. This is a case where less is definitely more. A quick little edit and insert here before we move on. I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention this previously, that the nook with the two chairs in it, I've provided two plugs one at the top where I'm circling the mouse and the other to the right. And the idea again, like with the, like with the plugs on either side of the bed, is that there might be a little side table with a table lamp on it and a person sitting in the chair would be reading the book by that table lamp. This provides a plug very close by so that you don't have a lot of cords trailing around. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please take a moment to click the like button and subscribe. This is quite a long series of videos now on this one design. I'll be adding a few more before it's finished. I've also done series on other styles of home. I've got a Victorian inspired farmhouse I'm working on, and I've got a couple of mid-century modern inspired designs also in the works. So do take a moment to check out the channel. Maybe you'll find other things that interest you. What we're seeing here is a little glimpse into the nook of the master bedroom. The SketchUp model doesn't show all the details, such as the light fixtures. I may put them in in order to do some renderings of the interior, but they're not usually strictly necessary if you're creating your working drawings. It's enough to put a little symbol on the floor plan as we were looking at. Anyhow, I hope you're enjoying this, and now we will carry on. Let's take a look at the study. Same thing. I think this is, again, a situation where less is more. I've provided two recessed lights, one in the general area of the desk and centered on the fireplace so that the fireplace uh, is like a little pool of light. And then the other opposite in between when you come in where I imagine there would be bookcases on each side. Again, I think a table lamp on the desk is a more practical way to put the focus lighting that you need for detailed work. Kitchen lighting is a big issue and too much to go into right now, so I'm going to pass on that. Maybe I'll make a separate video out of that. I've done some discussions of that in other videos already. Let's take a moment to talk about smoke detectors and smoke alarms. Uh, excuse me, smoke detectors, smoke alarms, and carbon monoxide alarms. We've got a two-car garage over on the right side. If we look at the garage here, I've placed a carbon monoxide detector in the garage. And then at each of the doors leading out of the garage on the wall, about halfway up the wall, there will be additional carbon monoxide detectors. That way, any fumes that come from the garage and start seeping into the house will be detected by those um, carbon monoxide alarms. I have also placed a smoke detector on the ceiling above each of those doors. There are a lot of little rules about where these things should be placed. It's not important that we go through all of those details right now. And the main thing is just to know that they need to be considered. So smoke detector on the ceiling, it should be probably about two to three feet in from each door. You don't want to have it tight up against the wall where the wall and the ceiling meet because oftentimes the smoke coming through a door won't get up into that tight space. So typically they're put two to three feet out from the door. I'm going to interject a couple more points about the garage. This is an edit after I completed the original. There are a few things that I think uh, would be good to keep in mind. 
Garages typically aren't always heated. Now the wall between the garage and the house is considered the edge of the conditioned space of the house and these walls are fully insulated. So the house can be fully heated and the garage could be completely unheated. However, in any climate that experiences close to freezing temperatures in winter, basically everywhere in my opinion in the United States, you might as well have a heated garage. Now it doesn't need to be heated to the same level as the house, but I think keeping it at no less than 50 to 55 degrees is a good idea. For a start, people do tend to use their garages for other purposes, such as woodworking shop or craft room or whatever. So you're going to want a little, probably want a little heat in there anyway. It can be on its own system. It can be on its own thermostat. It can be a completely independent system, but you will probably have a heat source in the garage. In addition, the garage really needs to be ventilated. Even if it's not used for anything other than parking a car, it should have its own intake and exhaust ventilation system. It can be as simple as something that goes on 15 minutes every hour, but that will keep the possibility of any kind of fumes from building up inside the garage. If it's a heated garage, combining the, the heat system with the ventilation system, you can use an air exchange, a air to air heat exchanger, and that will be more energy efficient. So these are things that happen that happen in garages. These are things to consider with your garage that kind of tie into the smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector issues. If you've got your garage ventilated, there's less likelihood of problems ever arising. And then places where they're required, definitely the garage doors between the garage and the house. Also in every bedroom, there should be one. And again, I've placed it on the ceiling. You can get combined carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. So I'm recommending that for the bedroom and it's on the ceiling again, about two feet in from the door. If a ceiling, excuse me, if a bedroom is served by a hallway, the hallway should also contain a smoke detector. So I've got one in this little lobby space in front of the bedroom. I'm not sure that this one in this particular case could strictly be required by code, but given how cheap they are, I think it's advisable to do it anyway. We'll take a quick look at the second floor plan where we have more bedrooms. I have not put any electrical into this plan yet, but I'll show you where things are going to go. We have a passage off to the right that leads to two bedrooms. So there will be one smoke detector in the ceiling, somewhere around the middle of that hallway, and then one inside each bedroom. There's also a passage going down to the bedroom on the left. Same thing, there'll be one in the hallway and one in the bedroom. And for good measure, I'm going to put one where the uh, optional bedroom could go. Just put the smoke detector there right now anyway, and then if the bedroom goes in, things don't have to be rewired. It'd be useful to have it there. Now the staircase is another place to consider a smoke detector, it's required. So figure that if there was smoke coming from downstairs and the smoke is rising, it's going to come up the stairwell. So near the top of the stair on the ceiling, you want to have a smoke detector as well. That way, any smoke coming from downstairs, upstairs will be detected at its first entry point. And lastly, this house doesn't have a habitable attic, but it is insulated and there's enough space up there to be able to stand up and move around a little bit. It's not large enough as a, to occupy to be used as a living space. But I'm going to indicate a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector, and they will be placed near where the chimney penetrates through the attic. That way, if anything should start in the attic, the alarms will sound. When you're building a new house, all of these alarms are interconnected so that if there's a detection in one place, all the alarms are activated so that everyone in the house knows about the danger. This is not always the case when you're retrofitting an existing house. Not always possible to do that and it's not always required. So that's everything about smoke detectors, smoke alarms, some basic thoughts on lighting. I think I'll mention one more point on lighting. This bedroom here, unfortunately only has one window and I mentioned natural light and how we should favor natural light as our first option. Well, the, the bedrooms at each end have windows in two walls and will probably be quite adequately lit by just those two windows. But the one in the middle here only has one. 
And if this optional, but optional bedroom gets built, it would only have one. So what I'm considering doing, although it's not strictly according to the style, is to put in a couple of these little, let me bring the picture up here, a couple of little light tubes. Rather than, I don't want to go with a full-blown skylight. I would like to use the light tubes and place the bulb, the dome of the light tube against the back roof rather than the front roof so that it's not seen from the street. But I thought I would incorporate a couple of light tubes into the plan. I'll have one that brings light down over the door, near the doorway of the bedroom. Brings a little natural light on the side of the room opposite the window so that there's a little more distribution of light. And another in the general center, generally the same vicinity for the optional bedroom that will also be putting the tubes on the back side of the house so that the glass domes of the light tubes will be visible from the backyard, but not from the front. So that was my way of dealing with a situation where we don't have the option of windows on two sides of the room. I think that will make the rooms quite nice and uh, certainly better than average. That wraps up this video for today. I hope you found some useful information. There's a lot to cover. Each of these uh, subjects could be a full video on its own. Lighting, electrical placement, smoke detectors, and carbon monoxide detectors. If there's any of that you want me to go into more detail about, let me know in a comment. I'll be happy to do so. I should add one more issue. The way to show this information on your construction drawings using layout. I just touched on that a little bit here. So I can spend more time on that as well, if you would like. I'm going to do a live modeling session of making those little lamps to go on either side of the front door. That'll be coming up in the next few days. And let's see what else. Well, I hope you liked this. If you did, please hit that like button and subscribe. Let your friends know if you find these this series of videos interesting. I think I've probably put a whole lot of detail into these videos that you're not going to find in a lot of other places, both design information and sketch up modeling information. Thanks for joining me today and have a wonderful day.